This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Keeping the World Company, which is a way of comparing the U.S. and other countries. You know, one, one thing that uh, strikes me is, that, you know, we, we talk about living in bubbles. And I think the U.S. does live in bubbles. It doesn't, it doesn't make, um, you know, comparison with other places. And I think to appreciate whether it's doing well or not, we should, from time to time, compare the way our systems, um, you know, our government, um, our culture compares with other countries. For this discussion, we have my co-host, uh, Tim Apicello. We have uh, our esteemed guest, Manfred Henningsen. And we have our regular contributor, Stephanie Stolt dalton And we're going to talk about the comparison of the justice system, that means criminal justice system, in America versus uh, Europe. And there's a lot of interesting wrinkles to that. Let me begin this discussion uh, with Tim. Tim, you know, if you were investigated and indicted and prosecuted and tried uh, and punished, ultimately, and subject to appeal, ultimately, um, in the U.S. versus Europe, where would you rather be tried? In Europe. Why? I think our justice system isn't so much justice. And I think I said this on a previous show. I got in big trouble when I was in sixth grade. Uh, reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. And the final part was uh, when it says, for liberty and justice for all, I said, for liberty and justice for some. And I was hauled off to the principal's office for saying that. Why did I say that in sixth grade? Because I believed then, and as I firmly believe now, that the justice system is those who have financial resources to mount a, a, a reasonable defense for the charges levied against me or the accused. And so often we have people in jail because they take a plea. They take a plea bargain. Why do they take a plea bargain? Because they don't have the financial resources to hire a competent attorney. And they know well that the public defender is way overburdened and certainly doesn't have the time and resources to mount an adequate and reasonable defense for the crime that you're being accused of. Okay, let me ask you the same question, Manfred. If you were uh, you know, charged with a crime and based a, a justice system, which justice system would you prefer? I think I would prefer the uh, Europe, but I mean, you have to remember you have, uh, Europe is not an entity, even though it's called European Union, but they don't have a constitution. You know, they tried to get one in uh, 2005, but the president of the constitutional Assembly, the former president Giscard d'Estaing, made this mistake of sending to all French citizens a document of 800 pages. And so the constitutional draft was uh, accepted in Spain in a plebiscite in uh, really with overwhelming majority, and the French voted it down, and then the Irish. And the next two would have been the United Kingdom and uh, Denmark. So what you are confronted with when you're speaking about Europe, uh, it's a unity, it's a union in disunity, in disunion. Uh, and oh, oh, I suppose the United States, you know, which also says has the word united, doesn't it? It has the word united in the United States. And, and, the, and they say we have a constitution. But, um, you know, the Supreme Court uh, it has, um, you know, done some heavy work on it. Uh, in any event, we, we also have our disparities. Institutionally as big as they are in Europe, you know, and that I find really very sad. Americans have the tendency of when they are comparing Europe with the United States, always talking about Great Britain. Uh, even though Great Britain should never have become part of any European entity, de Gaulle was right, keep them out. They suffer from an empire complex that they have still not overcome. <laughs> for, that, for that reason, uh, you know, one should tell American journalists, especially when they write about comparative politics, do not use Great Britain as the major comparison. Well, some but, people feel that Great Britain is great. The Brits do, but I mean, the Scots do not accept that, and the Welsh don't either. <laughs> um, but the Irish. Speak of, <laughs> speak of the Irish, you know. The English still believe, you know, uh, that they rule the waves. 
What has that know, got to do with the individual defendant who is hauled into court on a crime? What has that got to do with the system, you know, the process, uh, the way that individual is treated, um, the civil rights that are afforded to that individual? No, I, I would certainly uh, prefer being treated in, in, for example, since originally came from Germany, in Germany, I find the German uh, justice system more uh, just than the American. What do you mean by just? Well, the application of it, you don't have, uh, since uh, 1949, when West Germany came into being as a separate uh, country, you do not have uh, all of the restrictions that you had uh, before that in, in historical Germany. Whereas in the United States, you know, you have the baggage of 200 years that... Uh, what, what is that, racism? You mean racism? Is that what you're talking about? Or what's yeah, something else? It, it, yes, certainly. I mean, it's uh, one of the major f features, you know, of American history and American politics and the American justice system still is. You know, Manfred, there is, there is a migrant problem in Europe. Yes. And that, that's cultural, but it's also racist. And, you know, query whether um, that racism turns, turns into injustice, whether oh, it has infected the courts and the justice system and the prosecutors and the judges. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I, again, there are difference between the various um, countries that have been affected by it. Germany, as the result of having come of having come to terms with their uh, macro criminal historical record, I think is better off than uh, most other European countries, including France, uh, formerly fascist Italy, and especially Scandinavia. I want to just mention that. Um... We were interviewing a young woman from HPU. I asked her, I said, how, how do you feel about the migrants? And she says, I am so jealous of Germany. I am so disappointed. She was from Sweden. I'm so disappointed, um, you know, in Sweden, because they are not nearly as kind to the migrants as Germany is. And um, that was a very interesting remark for a Scandinavian to make. But there you have it. Um, so, um, Stephanie, I didn't ask you the question. I need to ask you the question, too. If you were being charged with a crime, um, you know, where would you rather be facing justice? In the United States? Uh, and if so, where? Uh, or in Europe? And if so, where? Well, I'm sorry. I, I, I can only quote a line. It's simply the best, except for all the rest. And that's the U.S., okay? And with particular reference to... Um, Manfred mentioned Italy, and I know that young woman was unjustly handled in that Italian case against um, her slain roommate. And then there are a couple of other examples I'm sure we could crank up here, but um, I just haven't seen anything that encourages me to select <laughs> to out of the U.S. justice system with all of its faults. Well, let's drill down a little bit. Tim, you know, what are the good things, what are the bad things about the American justice system? that you would um, include in your analysis here? Uh, well, what comes to my mind right off the top is you are presumed innocent until proven gu guilty. Also, um, things that came later was your Miranda rights, the right not to self-incriminate, um, your ability to cite the fifth uh, in the Constitution, the Fifth Amendment, that's protection against self-incrimination. Uh, I like those things. Yeah, but yeah, with all of that, you know, is it really working? All the plea bargains of people who... Well, that's my you know, point. Uh, yeah. The plea bargains come as a result of you don't have enough uh, financial resources to mount a lengthy and, and arduous uh, defense. So it's so money. There are a lot of people who are incarcerated because they didn't have the financial resources. And so they took the plea. They took the plea bargain. Where's justice in that? Yeah, where, and where's justice in the fact that uh, the United States percentage-wise, has more people in jail than any other country. Um, and most of them are from um, economically adverse um, families and households. And took the plea, as you said. And took the plea. And I, I asked the question again, and I never get a real answer, is where is the justice in that? Okay, and Stephanie, let's go to you. I mean, what, what do you like or dislike about the American justice system? I mean, there's a great, huge amount of rhetoric, you know, that comes out, civil rights and the battle for civil rights over a couple of centuries. Um, but, you know, is it working? If you had to make that decision your own self, 
or a member of your family or a friend? Um, what would trouble you about the American justice system? I would focus on my troubles. I would go back to Tim's list, all of those protections that you know you have. And you don't need a high-powered lawyer to, to make sure those protections extend to you or your family member or friend. But I just think we're in that situation again. And I, I quoted uh, Tina Turner, of course, um, I, but I took the second phrase, which I shouldn't have. It's like with the democracy definition, you know, it's um, it's the worst government governance system possible, except for all the rest. And certainly I would say the same thing about the legal. So there are many, many flaws and one has to be careful for those and that you have got the plea because I don't know that Russia gives the plea or places that are corrupt in their practices. And I, I don't know any others except maybe Britain. Why do you use Russia? Yeah, I was going to ask you that, Manfred. What I mean, about Russia? The, what about the a, autocracies in Europe? Uh, would strange, you go there? It's a strange reference at this point to, you know, quote Russia at all in the discussion of criminal justice. There is uh, no justice. <laughs> huh? Yeah. There is I mean, no justice. So for there is no justice, yes. I mean, so for that reason, uh, this comparison I find uh, somewhat bizarre. But the case, no, no, but I mean, in this particular case, in this particular case, it should not be even mentioned. The reason I think that we need to talk about Russia and autocracies in general is that they are the flip side. If you have an autocracy, if a democracy, you know, deteriorates into an autocracy, you have Vladimir Putin and Navalny and how many others. Uh, that are held without any civil rights at all, that are essentially sentenced to death for whatever they do um, by being incarcerated and God knows what happens in prison. This happens in China too. So autocracy takes away any, any you know, veneer of civil rights um, and it makes a mockery out of the justice system in general. And so if we allow you know, our democracy, our representative government, our civil rights protections to deteriorate, and they might very well do that under another administration from Trump, you know, who attacked the prosecutor and who every day, as we see it in the news, he, he makes a mockery of the justice system, um, then we might go there. We might go to Navalny and Lubyanka prison in Moscow and all the Solzhenitsyn stories in, you know, in the archipelago. Um, so um, don't you think that's relevant to this discussion? It is uh, important, and especially in connection with the European Union, because you have in the European Union two countries, Hungary and Poland, uh, that show autocratic, autocratic uh, signs. Hungary, maybe even more so than Poland, but Poland is not far behind. So what you have here, I think this defect of the constitutional construction of the European Union not being constitutionally a union, the only power that the European Union has uh, to get at Hungary and Poland is simply cut the money flow, the support, the financial support of the European Union to both countries. And they have done it recently to Hungary. One of the requirements for the EU is you cannot have the death penalty in your country. So it's As it's all of Europe, and strangely enough, you also in the Russia. Russia uh, abided by that. Um, so you have uh, the abolition of the uh, death penalty in all European countries. Yeah, what does it mean, Tim, that we have the death penalty here in, in several some... states, and we see it on the, on the news when somebody is about to be executed through some really inhumane technique? Um, what does it mean? What does it say about our country that we still have the death penalty and the Supreme Court hasn't, you know, um, hasn't stopped it? There's traditions that go hundreds of years in our country. And I, I really think a lot of our problems, and um, I hope uh, the, the relatives or ancestors of John Withrop don't come after me legally, but I think the problem started with the Puritans. Uh, they had a certain way of dealing with things and they weren't very nice. They're pretty harsh. Things went south from there, you know, um, bad conflicts with the Native Americans. And, and, and so those traditions kind of just permeated through for decades and, and, and hundreds of years to where we are now. We're a hard nation when it comes to crime. Um, I'm, remind, I'm reminded of the Wild West form of justice. We're going to give you a fair trial, then we're going to hang you. You know, interestingly enough, and, and Manfred can confirm this, that, you know, in the early part of the 19th century, 
Uh, we all had the death penalty. You, the uh, United States had the death penalty, and so did what most of Europe, uh, Europe I suppose. The Enlightenment about the death penalty uh, did not um, really sweep across Europe until the middle of the 20th century. That's after World War II. It was after World War II. So, I mean, it's very interesting that um, the world has changed. The death penalty is no longer popular in Europe, and for that matter, as Manfred says, in, in Russia. And yet we still have it. And it's brutal, and it offends the sensibilities, and we still have it. Um, and, you know, is that a question of federalism? Is it a question of human rights? Is it a question of uh, head in the sand where we, 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 we want to punish people? You know, I remember, Manfred, I was telling you, I remember that there was a 60-minute show back a few years ago um, where they looked at the justice system in Germany. And they talked to some convicted murderers who were mowing the grass in a public park. That was part of their daily routine. And they seemed like they weren't crazy. They didn't seem pathological. The public was, um, you know, friendly with them. They were friendly with the public. They just happened to be murderers, and they were on the way to rehabilitation. I think the word rehabilitation actually pervades in a number of countries in Europe, but it doesn't pervade here. We, we're into punishment. We're into retribution. We're to keep those people away from us. And um, this is a completely different orientation. I don't think the United States has really learned about that. Stephanie, has the United States learned about rehabilitation in lieu of retribution? Well, I, that's slowly coming on, but let's face it, uh, we're out of the human, human history, and in human history, this, it's, it's spectacularly characterized by the death penalty, okay, in every way. So um, we're, we're barely, barely poking out of that into thinking at a higher level about how, how, how these criminal acts need to be handled. And I mean, the first step forward, folks, um, tell me, isn't it the Magna Carta? King John, 13th century, the barons finally got fed up and got organized and they got something written down. So uh, we've started there in the 13th century. <laughs> I would interject the laws of Hammurabi. <laughs> and then there were some of those more ancient ones, but these yeah. are all based on that. All of our philosophies and our principles and 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 um, commandments, Ten Commandments out of Egypt. So, I mean, all, all of this has been slowly accruing these... Well, it doesn't sound like we've made all that much progress. Well, we I mean, if you were, if you were also... black in this country yeah. and you were charged with a crime, um, yeah. would you prefer American justice or European justice? It's a well, simple answer. It would be. Uh, it would depend on the European country. Now, if you uh, want to I, I'd like to address that question, Jay, mm -hmm. because when this country and they signed off on the anti-lynching laws in the late 1800s. Okay, so you couldn't just take someone out in the street and, and lynch them. But what we'll do is we'll give you a fair trial, and then we'll hang you. And that's what happened. That's the, the court system, the, the jury trial system in the Deep South was nothing more than a legalized way of lynching and, and or incarceration for life. To add on to that, what is more cruel? Is, is the death penalty more cruel or put someone in a life sentence in solitary confinement so they drive themselves insane? I don't know. Um, take me out, take me out fast. You know, uh, Manfred, um, they say that um, public interest uh, is a function, and this is from the chat GBT Q&A that I did. I don't know if you had a chance to look at all that. I asked a bunch of questions about this to chat uh, GBT, and I got some very interesting answers. And one of, the, one of the points of interest is that if you have confidence in the system, you are much more likely to be interested in reforming the system. If you are not confident in the system, if you sort of don't care uh, that you're turned off by the system to a certain point, you don't want to reform it. You don't care. And, and this, is, this is very troublesome because, you know, we know in so many states we need to have reform of the system, not only the justice system, but, um, hey, the police. Uh, and also the prison system. And so, you know, I guess um, what I get here is that in the last few years, and I know Tim will agree anyway, in the last few years, we have lost confidence through the machinations of Donald Trump because he doesn't believe in the system. 
He always games the system. There are so many things he does and has done through his life to undermine the system and, and, and make it work for him only, but not for the community, um, that people may have lost confidence in it, and thus they're not interested in reforming it. What do you think about Trump and his machinations and all the stories about how a special brand of justice exists for him and his friends? I find it very interesting that you are speaking about the loss of trust. You know, if you look at France today, you could say it's the only Western country where this lack of trust becomes manifested in large-scale protest demonstrations, uh, starting with the Yellow Vests uh, and now having to do with uh, protest against raising the retirement age from 62 to 64. I mean, as an issue, it's bizarre. Most European countries have, at this point, a retirement age of 65. In some cases, it goes already up to 67. But what I find interesting uh, about these French protests is it's a manifestation of distrust and trust at the same time, because these demonstrators really believe that they're revolutionary looking protests, you know, and the violence that is sometimes connected with it will change the system. Whereas Macron, you know, sits there in the LSA palace and uh, doesn't give a damn uh, and goes ahead uh, with uh, what he had designed, you know, as being necessary. And I think his political arguments for raising the retirement age from 62 to 64 are rational. I mean, they make a lot of sense. Everybody who looks at uh, the French retirement system would say uh, the French are nuts. They had a show about this only a few days ago with a young fellow who uh, treats himself as a liberal progressive in Paris. Um, what he said is, yeah, sure, the, the retirement age is a proxy issue. Um, the, real, the real issue is how Macron is uh, conducting himself in the matter. The, the style he has. And, and the other issue is that the French, and this goes right back to Les Miserables, goes back to the French Revolution, feel that they have to be free to express themselves outside of government. And they have to be free to express themselves in the street. The revolution in France is not over, just as some people say the revolution in the U.S. is not over. If they have lost confidence in the French government and system and constitution, does that somehow affect their confidence in, in criminal justice, too? If they lose confidence about the government in one way, as Trump has helped us do, um, aren't they also losing confidence in other ways? Because the, the thing where the government actually touches you is in your taxes, which we don't have the same confidence that we had before after the, quote, Tax Reform Act of 2017 where he treated the 1% against the 99, um, and, then, uh, and, and then criminal justice. Those are the things where the citizen is directly engaged with the government. And if you are unhappy with the government, you are unhappy with those two things. So in France, isn't it so that this lack of confidence, not about the retirement age, but about everything, affects their view of criminal justice also? Well, look, you have um, really a whole, whole, I mean, a whole array of protests in the United States um, today. I mean, you have the the anti uh, assault weapon demonstrations by by school children. Uh, you have, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter uh, demons. So you have all kinds of demonstrations in the United States that resemble in their intensity demonstrations in France. So you could say all of these demonstrations, not only those in France, but those in the United States also, confirm in a way a trust relationship to the possibility of the system against which they protest of change. For that reason, you know, I find it interesting when you are looking at uh, Turkey 
uh, you know, you have now the repeat election very soon, and people think Erdogan will win. Where are these protests? And strangely enough, you know, a majority of the Turks living in Germany, you know, they are by now around four million. A majority of them who are still having the right to vote in Turkey will vote for Erdogan also. I mean, they found that out. And uh, the Turks who uh, have become German citizens and do not understand their fellow Turkish uh, community members where this madness comes from. They have madness in Turkey? Um, I could I could cite a number of instances to prove to you we have madness in this country. No, no, absolutely. Uh, but I mean, what I wanted to simply say is you do not have uh, the consistency of these protest movements. No, and, and that is the problem. As I was saying, in France, the culture, the history, um, the whole track of it since the revolution. But you have that here, too. You have that in the United States, too. Absolutely. And, and you know, that's, it's very interesting. In the United States, in the United States, some of these protests are, are not about the government doing too much. It's not about protecting our civil liberties. It's about the government doing too little. Right. And Rachel, Rachel Maddow had a really interesting podcast where she demonstrated that there were, there were Nazis involved um, in the government, in the, in the United States Congress back in mm, the 30s. You know, there were plenty of Nazis in the 30s here. And, yeah, and American Friends is a wonderful book. Yeah, and, 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 what, and what, what happened is you had all these trials of people who were really on the wrong side. They were fascist. On, on, the one, on, the, on the side of, um, you know, bringing the country down in the 30s, and we have that now too, don't we? Um, and the, the public had lost confidence, not because the government had done too much, but it had done too little. And the Department of Justice lost the cases, and the public was outraged that the Department of Justice could not bring them to justice. And, and does that remind you in any way of Mar-a-Lago? Does it remind you in any way of January 6th? Uh, Tim, do you think the public has more or less confidence um, in the criminal justice system in this country? And I guess I would have to say that the, um, if the argument against that is what happened uh, with regard to this fellow in the Oath Keepers who was uh, sentenced to 18 years. 18 years. Yep. 18, that's pretty serious. <clears throat> but do you think you know, once it took a long time, right? And we weren't sure. Um, and, I, and I wonder if um, these events um, where people don't feel the government has done enough um, are a problem in terms of public confidence. Well, done enough. I think in some cases they've done more than enough uh, with the Dodd case and uh, overturning of Ray, uh, you know, Roe v. Wade. But, you know, Americans are idealists by and large. And so when we look at the Statue of Justice with a blindfold, we expect our judges to be blindfolded, and, and there's a process, uh, a judicial process, of uh, determining one's guilt or innocence. The problem is, I think most Americans now think that politics have influenced our judges, and the decisions rendered by those judges, and might I mention the Supreme Court, um, are tainted. They've been painted by a political persuasion. And um, the persuasion comes to mind is Donald Trump and his influence on the Supreme Court and his selection of Supreme Court justices. So uh, a lot of people are starting to think, hey, the game's rigged. Supreme Court, I think it's very important in comparison, for example, with Germany, where you have a Supreme Court, which was uh, in a way a model, modeled after the American Supreme Court when West Germany became a republic in September uh, 1949. This Supreme Court has today two Senates. They have 16 judges, which are chosen by the parliament for 12 years. And after 12 years, they will not be uh, possible to become uh, reappointed. So what you have in the German case, you have a wonderful counter example to the madness uh, of uh, the American Supreme Court, the institutional madness of the American Supreme Court, having life appointments. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, for that reason, you know, if you have term limits, 
for the judges to the Supreme Court, uh, you know, term limits of 12 years with no reappointment, uh, I think that would be a solution. But for some strange reason, you know, the, <laughs> the madness of American politics uh, is supported by the madness of some of the ancient institutional uh, restrictions that you have in the uh, that you have since the founding, including you know the electoral college, and uh, since 1791 uh, the Second Amendment. You know this is a madness uh, institutionalized as well. No other Western country has that the right you know for citizens to defend themselves. That is handed over to the to the sovereign. What about corruption? Can we talk about corruption just for a little bit? We know that there's a lot of corruption. The American judiciaries, including federal and state, I would I would never have thought federal, but you know, lately I begin to question whether federal, whether there is corruption in the federal judiciary. Um, but um, what about Europe? You know, you have the, uh, the civil law judges, and I I would say by and large they are younger. Their terms are not that long. Um, they are more of the people, if you will. Um, they're, are they subject to corruption? They're yeah, human. <laughs> Bingo. You heard it right here. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> so for that reason, by definition of the birth. Stephanie, you've been, you've been nodding your head. You want to say something on this, don't you? Um, you know, the, 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 the problem about public confidence, the problem about the American judiciary, um, and the problem of trying to fix it. Right. The American judiciary, uh, in its own way, has been gerrymandered, as you've referred to, and uh, at all the expectations and, and principles and standards for judges for honor and integrity that used to exist and actually used to be uh, enacted have all changed. So it's all changed. And all of the trust that was placed and faith in these people who were put in these special judiciary positions is no longer um, deserved. Because, yeah. so, and let me just give you the example here in Hawaii, Bishop of State, the mm -hmm. Bernice Pauahi Bishop, when she sought out those who would be responsible for selecting trustees of the Bishop of State needed to be a organi little organization uh, that would exist in perpetuity and have the honor and dignity and integrity to manage to put people in who were deserved learned and able to function and she chose for that position to go on for centuries in perpetuity mm -hmm. the, 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 the judiciary the, the leaders of the judiciary the, the mm -hmm. supreme court judges of hawaii that is where the corruption went in that led to the tremendous difficulties that they hey, we, we're out of time stephanie we, we got about one minute apiece <laughs> Okay. Uh, to to um, summarize and leave a thought about this very difficult subject, uh, yeah. and and I frame the question to you, Tim, as what can we learn from the you know the Gestalt in Europe? I know that there are different situations in different countries, that's for sure. But from the best we find in Europe, what can we learn from them, and what can they learn from us? Wow, tough question. Um, quickly, I'm going to go to Manfred's comment. They're human. And if the judicial system or any system of government, we have to acknowledge that corruption is part of the human nature. Therefore, there has to be built in safeguards, not only implemented and approved, but maintained and, and oversight of those safeguards. And without it, you have an autocracy of sorts. OK. Um, and Stephanie, your your final comment, hold it to one minute. Yeah, well, I'm just going to pick up from what Tim said, because now that has been uh, played out through our own Supreme Court, no code of ethics that actually was specific to them and their particular needs to be overseen. So, and we're suffering from that now because there used to be one way of thinking about these people. There used to be one way that they acted. Now it's changed, corruption is there. Okay, so in the Western, Western Europe and in the West in general, Manfred, how important is it that we reform these issues? Because as I mentioned, for most people, it's tax, and criminal law that way they engage with the system. What can we do to give them the confidence to mm, make the system more sustainable? I think the Americans have to first stop 
looking always to the United Kingdom. United Kingdom is old history, and they have not come to terms with their own uh, history. But I find it always absurd. These English comparisons are brought up by journalists. I think it has to do with the lack of education. They should look to Germany, for example, the Supreme Court, this originalism argument uh, is sheer ideology. It's stupid. Uh, I mean, constitutions are living documents. People, I mean, look at us. We are getting old. We shouldn't do this here, you know, in perpetuity. We should be replaced by younger people. Hey, speaking of perpetuity, um, we have we have to we have to say farewell. Thank you very much, men, for joining us today. And Tim, thank you so much. And thank Stephanie, you. thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.